And today, if you're here watching this video, unlucky. No, if you're a subscriber, perhaps you might have seen the community page basically put on there about where it goes wrong with the damp surveys. And there was quite a lot of interest and the majority of people wanted to see a video about that. Now, the video, it's got two purposes. Number uno, number uno is for me, basically, because I have the same scenario day in, day out, where people have um, paid for a survey and they've basically been tucked up. And I'm trying to explain myself and, you know, I just thought, if I make a little video, watch the video, come back to me if you want to come back to me. But number two, the lay person. The lay person does know not the what, does know, doesn't know what to ask. And perhaps if you've had a survey, you probably look at this and you're thinking, ah, that sort of like makes sense. Now, I've got to hold my hands up. Years ago, I didn't have a clue when I started. So whilst I've got over 20 years experience, it doesn't mean I've been doing everything right for 20 odd years. I can hand, hold my hands up and say, when I first started, it, I didn't do it right. Now there's, there's genuine reasons for that because I actually thought it was right. Years ago there wasn't a training available, there's lots of great blogs and videos online and also you've got all the standards because you've got the internet. There's, it's out there, it's easily accessible now, so there is no excuse. So, I want something from you now. I'm going to do go through the damp survey test as I call it and it's going to be right at the end of the video. So, I'll be honest with you, this video is going to natter on a little bit, you might want to stop it, you might want to get yourself a beer, a coffee, a cup of tea, some ginger nuts, a bottle of wine, I don't know. But what I want you to do, if you've just had a recent damp survey, please let me know in the comments below. Did you get offered a non-invasive survey? Or did you get a non-destructive? Or did you get options from different types of surveys for different costs? I'd be really interested just to see what you got offered. That would be really helpful for me. Thank you. So you might be thinking, what is an invasive? intrusive, non-invasive survey. What the hell is Ross going on about? Well, basically, an invasive survey means you, an intrusive, you're going to make a little bit of mess. So just say it's cavity construction. We're going to drill into the cavity, put a camera in that. We're going to cut a bit of skirting board off, break the floor wall junction out, and expose the damp proof course. That's some of the stuff you could be doing. If it's a pre-purchase, you're not going to be able to do that type of survey. So non-invasive, non-intrusive is basically finding out what's going on. Non-invasive surveys, they are predominantly for pre-purchase because you cannot do anything like that sort of survey. But obviously, the non-invasive is a very common type of survey that is offered. <clears throat> so what we're gonna go back to again is something called common sense and common practice. Common sense, at the end of the, after you've watched this video, hopefully you're gonna understand the value of having a proper invasive survey following the British standards rather than a non-invasive survey that you could do, anybody could do. Get yourself a damp meter, ping, 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 on the walls. It doesn't offer any value, especially when you've got to repair a building. BS6576 and the RICS joint methodology. Now, so when I say about the RICS joint methodology, it's a basically a sort of like a white paper that's been sort of like put out there and RICS, PCA, um, Historic England, SPAD, CADU and other, other people basically have all been speaking and on about traditional buildings, best practice for repair and diagnostics. BS6576, I'll put some stuff at the end of this or anything. <clears throat> it basically tells you all the stuff you need to eliminate. Now, this is what I would say an averagely competent surveyor should be sort of like following. The British standards Whilst this white paper isn't actually, sort, whilst it's published and you can't, it's not, you know, it's best practice, shall we say, not everybody's following this sort of stuff. So you think about it, this is out there. The British standard's been out there for years, BS6576. This is what you should be doing. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't do it. Now, in my opinion, BS6576, the stuff it goes through in there, it's what I call common sense. It is common sense. And realistically, if you're looking at that, you will understand it as well. It is that basic. So, we've got different types of surveyors when it comes to damp. So you've got the chartered building surveyor. It's the king of the building surveyors, right? 
They've got to know a lot about a lot. I do not envy them because they have got so much to know about. But some of them will specialise in damp and they might have specialised in something like party walls and stuff like that. Um, some of them might do a lot of general like home buyer surveys. Some people just do level threes. They all do different stuff. Some are going to be, you know, very good at damp. Some perhaps not as good because that's just how it is. Now, when you come into the sort of damp side of things, you've got different types of airs. So you've got the consultant surveyor, somebody like Graham Coleman, specialises in a lot of data-driven um, surveys. <coughs> perhaps does a bit of expert witness stuff as well. And there's a few members that are true, ex um, true like consultants from the PCA, shall we say. Graham's a very good friend of mine. I owe a lot to him. Um, you know, he's taught me so much. And in a couple of weeks' time, you're going to hopefully see some stuff we're putting together. We've been talking about it for about 18 months now. So if you're a student and you're watching this, hopefully this is going to give you some really good information. Stuff that's not really out there, to be fair. Bearing in mind, Graham's had like over 50 years experience of this. You know, he is the best of the best. You know, he is the king of the damp and timber survey world. Now, you've also got freelance surveyors. So freelance surveyors, exactly that, they freelance, they work for other companies. So somebody like me could pull a freelance surveyor in, damp, damp and timber surveyor, and get a hand. I've never used one before, but I know lots of companies do, because obviously it works for them if they're really busy or really quiet, say it's employing somebody, for, or a long term, or what have you. And you've also got independent surveyors. So independent, again, they don't carry out any work, so they're non-biased, a bit like a consultant, shall we say. <coughs> but... They also, some of them sort of do consultancy work and what have you, which is where the confusion comes in. Because what some people get, they get the report for it and they signed off as an expert, this, and a consultant, and independent, and they're thinking, well, what is he? Or she, or what have you. And that same is transferred to somebody like me. The confusion can set in sometimes because you've still got contractors like myself that carry out independent surveys and also do contracting. So it's a bit like, hey, what is he? Well, Realistically, if somebody I know wants an independent survey, or somebody I don't know, and they want to pay me to travel and just carry out the survey, I'm happy to carry and do that. I do that very often. And also, I do the contracting side. I enjoy fixing buildings. Um, I'm not saying I'd never be an independent, but for the moment, how I am like this, I'm very happy doing contracting work. That's what I really enjoy. People like me, though, are seen as biased because we actually carry out the repair. I get that because there is terrible contractors out there. And there's also some brilliant ones. I've got a good friends in the industry. They're really good and they really strive and they really want to do a proper job and everything. They, you know, everything's bang on. But there is the bad ones out there. Now, there's the good and the bad with the contracting. There's the good and the bad with the independence as well. And I'm not, I'm not giving them a kick in here, but that is how it is. That is how it is, unfortunately. So, again, we're going back down to the damp test. In my opinion, it doesn't matter whether you're using the king of the trade, the chartered building surveyor, freelance, consultant, independent or contractor. If you follow the simple rules, what I'm going to show you, you'll still know whether they're trying to just like basically tuck you up. And I bet you're thinking, what's he going to go on about? What's happening? What's going on? You're going to see in a minute. This is really important the cost of the survey, because it's all down to the wonga. Now, let's be realistic. If you are paying, typically, for a non-invasive survey, right, let's just say it's a detached property, local to the surveyor, the damp surveyor, shall we say, so cost not so much travel time. If it's a non-invasive, non-destructive survey, Basically, they're going to be on site for an hour. So, pull up, into neutral, out the door, you alright love? Yeah, just take some pictures outside, they'll be in, whatever. <coughs> 10 minutes, give them 10 minutes. Roughly about 10 minutes, say, maybe 15, I don't know. Remember, it's non-invasive, non-intrusive. Inside, small talk, coffee, dunk a couple of ginger nuts, <coughs> kick the crumbs under the table, sorry, sorry. And then basically, that's, you give them sort of like 45, 50 minutes to have a little look round. And if it's a non-invasive and non-intrusive survey, a little damp meter, sketch plan. If you're efficient, you probably took that off right move previously if there was one there. So you're just marking everything up. Lots of pictures. <coughs> and you look marking up the sketch plans or whatever, what you can find your problems. A few moisture profiles. 
It's an hour. It is an hour on site for a non-invasive survey. Fact, right? That hour on site on a standard template report, because you haven't done, not much work's been done there on site, it's an hour. So it's two hours maximum. So if somebody's charging you £500, that's £250 per hour. Obviously there's travel time in there and what have you. We've all got overheads at different overheads. But independents haven't got overheads like somebody, like me. We've got big overheads, even though we're a little company. Because they've just got basically a car and a bit of kit. Now, that's fine. That's fair enough. When it comes to an invasive survey, so if I'm employed to do an invasive survey, you've got drains, pressure tests, looking at everything. You're cutting the skirt and boards off, moisture profiling, up the walls, taking samples, doing gravimetrics or carbide tests, cavity, your camera. We'll put a specification of repair, right? You've got to save all that into a project folder. You've got lots and lots of notes, lots of videos, images, everything. That will be Say you got there at nine, you're going to be finishing early afternoon-ish, right? You're, you're good for nothing after that. You might pop in and have a look at a woodworm job at the end of the day. So you've got one survey done in a day. As I said earlier on, a non-invasive survey, whoever's carrying that out, they could do maybe three or four or five in a day, right? Putting all that into a report is a day, an invasive survey. It's a day gone. So basically you're looking at two days for a proper survey, including the report, rather than a non-invasive non-intrusive which is two hours that is why there's huge amounts of cost involved so that is why the cost of the damp surveys will vary my ones are going to be more expensive because in my opinion we do a lot more especially when you're messing about with drains and stuff like that because <clears throat> if you've got to get into soakaways and you've got to sometimes core in because you can't get access put access points in and you're trying to flood soakaways might even use a bit of ground penetrating radar on a few stuff and that have you. So some of the stuff we've, surveys we've done lately, they have been a bit on the pricey side of stuff. But I tell you what, the customer's got a value because we've actually found the other stuff people haven't sometimes found because they've been doing the basic surveys. So I'm going to run you through now a couple of scenarios. And again, I'm not picking on independent damp surveyors. It's just that. I don't really get many contractors reports sent to me. I get a lot of damp, independent damp ones. So a, con a customer is basically um, looked online, they find an independent survey, they've got the report and it gets emailed over. And it's literally, can you repair, give me a price to repair this building from the report. Their perception is, once I've read that six page report, that I can actually price that building to repair it. It's impossible. So the one I had the other day, let's just call her Mrs. Smith. Lovely lady, completely just shot with everything, just the worry of everything that's going on. Anyway, she's paid 400 odd pounds, I think, for this survey, right? And basically, it was of no value whatsoever. So I have to give her the bad news and say, look, I cannot quote on this what you've given me. And she, she's like, why? And this is, again, I'm talking about this video. I said, because it's a non-invasive, non-intrusive survey. You need to eliminate everything before coming to a conclusion. Then you can think about repairing the building. Anyway, it started dropping. <clears throat> and she was like saying, yeah, you know, they didn't lift the man out. They didn't lift the man out. Um, yeah, thinking about it, he never even looked at the stop cut, stopped um, cock or what have you. No samples. A few damp mirrors. Yeah, he was in a rush. I knew he was looking at his clock, he had to get on. Seen him on the phone saying, yeah, I'll be there in a minute, I'm just leaving this one, got caught up in the last one. Didn't care, basically. Took the money, took the money though. But, um, <clears throat> but what was interesting was, subsequently from then, she contacted another two people that had recommended him because they'd done some surveys for them from some Facebook thing they were on about. They had exactly the same reports, basically. Same sort of stuff. They copied, they looked them all. And interestingly enough, guess what they were offered? When they spoke to him, it was just the one survey. They didn't know what, they were getting a damp survey. They didn't know what survey they were getting. As far as I know, it was a damp survey. And then, basically, in the report, it basically says, this is not for any third party, it's for you only. Nobody can rely on it apart from you. So that basically saying, that report she's paid for, she should be sending it to me, and should be relying on it. So have a look in your report if you've had one basically says that it says that and then it also goes to say 
you ask for a non-invasive, non-intrusive survey. If you want an invasive survey, um, samples done like gravimetrics, as everybody should be doing, what have you, that's going to come to additional costs. So she rang back and left a voicemail trying to get these additional costs. Guess what? Never come back to her. Never come back to her. So the scenario is, if somebody said to you, oh, we can do a non-invasive survey for, so just say, £350, or while we're there, we can allow so much extra to do an invasive survey. <clears throat> That's fair enough. If they, you know, but if you're going to be looking at those sort of buildings, in my opinion, an averagely competent person knows you cannot do any good diagnostics without like making a mess. So, with this one, I looked at for her. It was, you know, when I say hilarious, you couldn't believe the stuff that it was made, missed. Glaringly obvious. Typical busy surveyor. Like I am a slow surveyor. I admit I'm slow. I'm pretty conscientious, taking lots of pictures and having a little look in. I get in and out a couple of times, whatever you. It's like someone pulled the pin out of a grenade, rolled the thing down the drain, and <laughs> massive holes in the side of it, saturated the walls. You're drilling the walls, getting samples. It's like it's like mud coming out of that. Look at the videos before you, a lot of videos before, you'll see loads of them like it. There's loads of case study surveys like that. Um, she's absolutely furious because they've all left them brilliant reviews saying about how good he was. I don't think they've taken him down, but I was like, you know, come on. But like, if you look at it from most people's view, like some people do a bit of a snooping about having a little look around online to see what's going on when you're a lay person to find out about a damp survey and you're inquisitive. Some people just look up on Google, blah, 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 sponsored ads all down the front on there, whatever. Um, all the all the ads, all the um, paper on page one, you've got like the checker trades, my builders. They got so much search engine optimization on there. They're literally hammering it all the time. I'm down in page ten or something, hidden away. My website's pretty crap, to be fair. It's old. It's got dead links on it. I don't care. It's good enough. <clears throat> I've got to fix it, but I'm just busy, and I've got plenty of work on, so it's not really an issue. But you can see how some people just get duped into that. They think they're just because they're paying for an independent survey, nothing to sell, that's what they get. That's where they're wrong. Now, we've all got something to sell, whether you're an independent or contractor. I've got to sell stuff to you. I've got to sell my survey, I've got to sell my repair. Because I'm not a salesman, I, you know, I've got plenty of work on, but I still need people's work. I need your work, I need a survey, and I need a repair. But if you can see it from my point of view, and <clears throat> I've got a lot of work. We're a very small company, and I work for a lot of landlords, um, a lot of insurance stuff, and a lot of local builders and bits and bobs I know. I've been doing it for, like, say, for 20 odd years. So you can imagine, I don't need much work. So I can go there, as you can see my videos, I can identify root causes, and if it needs line plaster, line pointing, ground levels lowered, paint taken off, we can do that. I don't just sell a damp proof course or a PIV or something like that. Or I don't masquerade behind something where I've not got nothing to sell. Just say, I'll be honest with you. Yeah, we want work. Just like the independent surveyors. We're exactly the same. We've still got to sell a survey. Now, if somebody's like an independent surveyor, they've only got a couple of weeks work in front of them. I've got stuff booked in a couple of years time. I've got to do bits and bobs for people. So for me, I haven't got the pressure. Now this is where it goes wrong. We were talking about the cost of surveys. And like I said, I lose probably about 75% of mine just because of cost. So if you could imagine, if you've only got one or two weeks work to work in front of you, and all of a sudden you're charging say 500 pounds for a survey, and you've got to put your costs up to a thousand, and you've got to convert them, <coughs> and you're going to lose a load. Whether you're independent or contractor, that's just how it is. You've got to be able to take that hit and perhaps have no work. That is one of the reasons why, like I said, down to the Wonga. Because of that, you're always going to find a trend where people don't want to be taking them chances. Now, for me, it was a big commitment to do it. But <clears throat> I had to do it because that's just how it's right. You can't start preaching one thing and doing another. So, as you can see in the videos, Practice what I preach. I at least tried to anyway. Try to. So, going back to Mr. Smith again. The interesting one from the independence of air. 
So I was given this said report, which is not report, and it hasn't eliminated all the problems, and we knew that the drains were knackered because I've just told you that. Where it went with her was, this is where the sort of penny dropped of her. <clears throat> if you could imagine, I said to her, so you're asking me to carry out the repairs after they haven't done proper diagnostics? Yes, basically. So I said, Mrs. Smith, if and when this does go wrong, who are you going to come back to? Me, aren't you? And she said, yeah. So I said, you're basically asking me to take the liability from a really poor survey, right? And also, you haven't given me the benefit of doing a survey and giving you some options of repair, rather than just this one-dimensional um, view of repairing this building. Using It was modern solutions, and it wasn't suitable for the building because obviously the drains are blown up. That is when she started clicking in then. She, it really like made her think, like, do you know what? That's not even fair. It's not even fair to me, is it? Ross, take all that liability. Take that liability. When it goes wrong, I'm going to ring you up. Now, I, can, I could be cleverer and say to her, I'll tell you what, I'll do the repair, and if it goes wrong, um, I'll take the liability. Or I could say, I can't take the liability, right? And I can actually say to her, like, realistically, if it goes wrong, you can't ring me. You're going to have to get back to your surveyor. I'm going to do the work as described in that report. If there's a problem, that's down to you to sort of in. But you've got to look at it realistically. I don't want to get a bad name, a bad reputation for failures and problems. So I've got to do the best thing for me and to walk away. So basically, I said to her, you know, I've got to walk away from this job. This is a quote to do the job properly, the survey properly. If you want to come back to me, happy days, happy days. Happy to talk you through the bits and bobs. Anyway, she did come back, like I said, we went down there and we fixed all the stuff. And best thing about it was, this went through the insurance for her. It got dried down. <clears throat> we got all the drain repairs and bits and bobs. We done some ground lowering, took some paint off and that. So I was really happy. I got the sort of work I wanted. The other stuff, the insurance job done, she was really happy because she didn't have to pay as much as she was quoted previously. Common sense be common practice, isn't it? Common sense makes sense, that type of survey. Common practice, cheap surveys, cheap, bloody, worthless, worthless information from you. So then, before I come back to the damp test, I want you to do me a favour. If you think this is giving you some value, I haven't finished yet, I want you to share it on some of your some of your social media or something that'd be really helpful for me because I know a lot of people that watch my stuff. I have helped them. I have take phone calls. I've done emails and this stuff. So I'd really appreciate a like um, and basically share it really just to get it out there. Whoa! Thanks for making it this far. I do appreciate, it. and you're probably thinking, "Oh my God, what is the damp test?" The damp scam test, the damp test, what's it going to be? Well, you're here now. So, basically, I've given you information, different types of surveys, different types of variants, what you should be expecting. So, you're going to get three pieces of information just after this. BS6576, BRE Digest 245, and the Joint Damp Methodology from RICS, SPAB, PCA, Historic Union, all the big guns, right? What you've got to think of now, you've got this information, you now know that a non-intrusive non investigation to basically, if you've got damp around the base of the walls, it's going to be of no value. It's not an investigation to find the root cause. I like the word investigation, damp investigation, because it sounds like you're going to do an investigation. So a damp investigation to the root cause will be a destructive survey, and it's going to cost a few quid, and you're going to have to spend a bit of time doing it. So what you've got to do is plead a little bit stupid. You've got this information now. When you phone them up, let them ask you the questions. Don't go saying I need it to this and I need to do that. Let them let you let them initially see if they're going to tell you you need this type of survey. Get them to email you a quote over and basically list what they're going to do on a survey. Now, also it's like what kit are they using? What kit? It's a big thing, like you've got people now raving about using a pole camera. Lots of people like me have been using them. I've done my first pole camera for 10 years ago. I made one out of a drain camera and a blimmin' flagpole. 
you know, are they doing the drains? Are they using thermal imaging? Are they taking samples of the plaster? Are they even doing salt tests? How many samples are they doing? How much salt testing are they doing? <laughs> are they going into the cavities? Are they exposing the damp proof course? Are they putting the cameras in there? What kit have they got? Really important. So once you get that information, you've got that emailed quote or whatever you has been posted or what have you, have a look at it. See what type of survey it is. Now, probably you're gonna get offered the non-invasive survey. So you've got a couple of options. Number one, drop kick them. Or number two, you could message them back and say, can you have a quote for a survey this in a proper investigation to find the root cause following the methodology in BS6576, which will be in, in a minute. Or you could just think, Do you know what? <sighs> I'm gonna move on to the next one because you know this is part of the damp test. They've tried initially tucking you up. Are you gonna have confidence in them? I know when people have tucked me up with stuff before, that's it. Once the confidence, once the trust is gone, see ya, don't wanna be, don't wanna know ya. Bye, right? So if you ring around, eventually you're gonna find someone. It is worth you spending that time ringing around or dropping a few emails just to see what they come back with. Um, and you will find someone, you will find someone that's gonna be able to add value to that survey and do it properly and be sure that the diagnostics and perhaps the repairs are gonna be right. So we're gonna leave it here now. You've got that information. Plead a little bit stupid, let, let them lead you. And now we're gonna to go to the standard, which is really important as well. The British standard BS6576 is the code of practice for the diagnosis of rising damp in walls of buildings and installation of chemical damp proof courses. Ignore the last bit, just think about the code of practice for diagnosis of rising damp in walls of buildings. This is the most imperative bit about it. This is what an averagely competent surveyor should be following. This is a screenshot from BS6576, so it's 4.2.1.3. And this is really, really important. It says all other possible causes of damp conditions should be located Particular attention should be paid to a condensation. So even with condensation, if someone's turned up at three o'clock in the afternoon, they're probably not gonna find condensation because we know it's normally happening first thing in the morning. So there could be a bit of residual moisture there giving high damp meter readings. That means it's rising damp. Lateral penetration associated with changes of floor and ground level. Um, leaks from roofs, gutters and downpipes. Faulty drains. It is the number one cause of rising damp in properties I have found. Um, I've got some really interesting videos. Have a look through them and you'll see them on there. Internal plumbing leaks, water penetration through external walls, water penetration around window frames and doors, mortar drop-ins or debris and cavity walls. Such a common problem. Talked about it earlier on. Cavity construction, it can have so many issues. Bridging the damp proof course because of mortar in there, plaster, render, all of that sort of stuff. And then also, last but not least, history of flooding, leaks and all of this sort of stuff. Again, it's becoming more problems with all this sort of stuff. So this is the basics an averagely competent surveyor. They should be eliminating A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. This is what you need to go back with and ask them afterwards. Are they going to eliminate all of this stuff for you as part of your damp investigation? This is really important. Another screenshot from BS6576, 4.2.1.1. When inspecting a structure for signs of rising damp, it is essential to take into account the possible presence of other sources of dampness. Even if the instructions give, given are limited to detection of rising damp, other problems should be highlighted if they are present and reasonably obvious. Note one. Visual observations, both externally and internally, are important and can provide much of the information needed to arrive at a preliminary diagnosis. Nevertheless, a full understanding of the distribution of dampness in a structure can require the use of various moisture measuring techniques. Surveyors need to be familiar with the use of, each of such equipment and the interpretation of results from them. Remember, I'm going to do a video on about the diagnostics. Note two, an electrical moisture meter is a useful diagnostic instrument. It can be used to discriminate between different explanations for damp conditions and is non-destructive. These things are brilliant, but they have limitations. The readings it gives are qualitative. Surface moisture measurements alone cannot give proof of rising damp. 
So further evidence where permitted be obtained by disruptive examination and measurements taken within the depth of the wall. Chemical or gravimetric can, methods can be used. Generally moisture content in excess of 5% wet weight in mortar joints at the base of the wall will indicate the need for further investigations. Gravimetric tests give more detail but require samples to be removed to the laboratory for testing. Chemical tests on site can only show the total moisture content. I've got a video explaining this I will drop in the comments below. That is a really good thing for a layperson because they'll understand the difference between gravimetrics and a carbide and again what you're getting for your money. And here we have BRE Digest 245 so it's a rise and damp in walls diagnosis and treatment. This is absolutely brilliant. It takes you through the, as you can see on the front page mechanism of rise and damp. It also goes through some drawings describing how you can have bridging of a damp proof course. And it also goes through about sort of like the hygroscopic region where you've got rising damp, the moisture content, and all of this sort of stuff in defining rising damp. And is it actually occurring? Is it just moisture causing a problem, like from rising damp or a leak or what have you, or is it just salt? Really, really important this is. And this is probably one of my favourite ones out of the lot. And Whilst it might seem a bit of a slow process, you know, the amount of money it could potentially save on some jobs, particularly when the diagnosis is critical, which in my opinion is every job, this is the go-to document. So this is the joint damp methodology and you can see all the logos there. So this is for the investigation of moisture and its effects in traditional buildings. So the joint damp methodology document, it is a currently a working draft. Until it's all finalised, you know, nobody can really sort of like be held to account for it as a competence of duty of care, shall we say. But it's got really good information in there, what, as I would say, an averagely competent surveyor should be looking at. So there's some really good information in there. I'm going to put a link down below that you can actually click onto and you can understand what is going on and what is written in there. And here we have it, the last bit, and the last bit is so important. But I like this bit, understanding moisture. So the surveyor needs to demonstrate a clear understanding of relationship of moisture and humidity and what have you. About all the equipment and understand the equipment, how to use it. That's just part of the stuff we use. But the last bit, if you look, the last paragraph, understand the difference between invasive and non-invasive tests and their implications this is what the whole of the surveying world have said about this is what i've been banging on about this whole video the limitations and implications of invasive non-invasive tests and surveys absolute waste of time and you here you have it here everybody has agreed to it historic england pat pca spab rex Cadu, everybody, yet people are still offering non-invasive surveys. They're a waste of time. Anyway, that is it now. Thanks for watching. I really do appreciate it. And we'll see you soon on the next one.